Again, uh, we're going to make our way to 2 Peter chapter 3 here in just a moment, but I want to make a few observations from the 50th Psalm. I'm not sure uh, how long it's been since you've read that. Certainly encourage you to do so. Uh, God is actually going to summons His people together. And so it starts out, Psalm 50 and verse 1, The mighty God, even the Lord, has spoken, called the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Verse 5, Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, and the heavens shall declare His righteousness, for God is judge Himself. And so this psalm sets out, first of all, God's summoning His people together. But not only by way of instruction, but also by way of counsel and judgment. Judgment. And so He will address the people there in verse 7, Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. And then He will address them uh, with regards to some things as it relates to sacrifices and their uh, ceremonies of worship and service to God. But now, drop, or I'm sorry, you're not reading with me, but now let me drop down to verse 16 and listen to this. But unto the wicked, God saith, what hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth, seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee? When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers. Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue framest deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. It's interesting, right? Mm -hmm. God here points out some of their sinful ways and behaviors, and He says, I've seen this, I've known this, but I've remained silent thus far. Remember, this was a scene of judgment. God was calling them together. Here He has enumerated many of their sins and transgressions. And maybe because of His having been silent to this point, they thought that God would not address their, their sins. But now watch. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Verse 21 continues, Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself. Let me ask you, do you think man sometimes is guilty of that? Do you think we are inclined to think of God as being one of us? And so many of the shortcomings and many of the things that we would do that God's going to do? I think God was here sounding a warning. The warning was an implied one. Don't think that I'm like you. They may have interpreted God's silence to this point as though God didn't care. God was indifferent. God was going to be willing to overlook their sinful behavior. But the remainder of that verse says, But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. See, God is not like us in that respect. God will settle all accounts at the appointed time. But I wanted to especially focus in on that phrase that God said by way of, if you will, rebuke to His people. And again, I think it's a, a universal warning, lest we somehow think that God is like us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there are some ways in which God is not like us at all. And that's why I ask you to join with me in 2 Peter chapter 3. You see, 2 Peter chapter 3, much like Psalm 50, has to do with judgment. Here, Peter is assuring those to whom he was writing that even though there were scoffers who disclaimed God's promise 
to come again and destroy the world and bring judgment upon the wicked? They should not. They should not think that this is not going to happen. It's interesting, as Peter opens this chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3, he says in verse 30, no, or in verse 3, excuse me, knowing this first, that there will come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. You see their argument? They're talking about God's promise of coming. Jesus' return. A return that, as we know, will signal the end of this world. As we know it, Peter will go on to explain that. And a judgment upon all humanity. But their question is, as scoffers, as, as mockers, they're saying, well, he hasn't done it yet. Kind of like what the psalmist, what God said through the psalmist. I've been silent to this point. I haven't come yet, but don't interpret that as though I'm not coming. And see, that's how they were interpreting this. Nothing has changed since the beginning of time. Everything has continued as it has been. Well, Peter immediately addresses that in verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. He's asking these scoffers, have you forgotten about Noah's day? Have you forgotten about the flood? You said everything has continued the way it has been since the beginning. Do you not remember when God opened the windows of heaven, opened and broken up the fountains of the deep, and covered and destroyed this world and all the inhabitants of it? You don't remember that. See, he is correcting their false arguments. Things haven't always been the way they are now. And he reminds them of that universal flood. But now watch, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, after the flood, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved, notice, unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition or destruction of ungodly men. Friends, the same word of God that sent the flood, that same powerful word today is reserving the earth, is preserving it up until this time, but it will eventually meet a fiery destruction that will coincide with a judgment, a divine judgment by God on the ungodly that will bring their eternal ruin. Now, how are we to respond to the fact that God hasn't done it yet? See, that's what they were scoffing at. He promised it. He's promised it through the ages, and yet it hasn't happened yet. How should we interpret that? Verse 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. See, that's one of the ways, uh, Ricky, in which God and man are different. Mm -hmm. See, we make a promise. And the longer, the longer the time between making the promise and fulfilling it, the more likely we are to do what? Forget it. Or circumstances change so that we can't make good on it. Or just decide that, well, they have forgotten it. I, I, I don't need to keep my promise anymore. But that's not like God. With God, a thousand years is as a day. A day is as a thousand years. Time is no barrier to God when it comes to keeping his promises. And so verse 9, the Lord, unlike us sometimes, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Why hasn't the world been destroyed? Why hasn't Jesus come? Why hasn't the judgment been ushered in? Here's the answer. God has been long-suffering He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But does that mean he's not going to act one day? 
verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise, the elements shall melt with fervent heat, the earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Friends, we shouldn't reason that God is like we are. And especially when it comes to his promises. When God makes a promise, such as the promises that he made concerning the Lord's return and the fiery destruction of all that we see about us, everything that is physical, one day will be dissolved by fervent heat. And that that will introduce or usher in a judgment in which God is going to judge the unrighteous. God's promises are sure. They're certain. In other words, God means what he says. Even though we might interpret the fact that it hasn't happened yet as though God won't, won't do it or and maybe has changed his mind or has now become indifferent or is over. No. God promised it. It will come to pass. I use this by way of an introduction to bring us back to where we left off last week in talking about God means what he says. Back up to chapter 2. Hopefully you remember that's where we had been developing some thoughts with regards to the Bible's teaching us that God means what he says. Here you might remember that Peter had introduced the ever-present threat of false teachers. False teachers who, be, by their deceitful, uh, erroneous doctrines and heresies, even denying Jesus himself, could bring about the spiritual ruin of these that Paul, that Peter was seeking to encourage, to grow in the knowledge, grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But here were those false teachers who could threaten that growth, who could even bring about jeopardy for their souls. And so we spent a little time last week looking at how Peter described these false teachers how that they are always present. Every generation of God's people are going to know of them because they will be around. And what they are trying to do by way of craftily, very artfully, and, and uh, very privately propagating their false doctrines, again, doctrines that would even find them denying their master, the Lord who died in their stead. Peter also that they're going to be rather successful. Notice, many, verse 2, shall follow their pernicious ways. And then, as we noted, one of the very heartbreaking consequences of false teachers is, since they connect or associate themselves with Christianity, many see their doctrines, see the results of their false doctrines, and therefore have a bad opinion of Christianity, the way of truth. These lies that they peddle too often cause others to have, uh, again, an incorrect opinion about the truth. But then we noticed something else as it relates to these false doctrines, or excuse me, these false teachers, all those who were duped by their erroneous doctrines. In fact, we suggested that they were but representative of all the wicked. And that's one of the reasons I brought in 2 Peter chapter 3 there. This judgment that God is going to bring upon the earth is upon all the ungodly. And so even though he's addressing false teachers and their duped followers in chapter 2, the judgment that he speaks of in verse 3 is applicable to all who rebel against heaven's authority, who are indifferent towards sin and continue in a course and life of sin. Here's what they are hastening toward. Look at the end of verse 3. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation or destruction slumbereth not. Even though God may have not acted yet, even though he may have remained silent, even though Jesus hasn't returned and the judgment hasn't been ushered in, friends, God means what he says. 
this judgment of which he speaks is sure. It's certain. Why? Because God means what he says. He's not like man. When he makes a promise, he's going to keep it. He's going to keep it. In fact, you don't have to leave. We're coming back there in just a moment. But over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, it's an interesting statement with regards to the difference between God and man. It says in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13, if we believe not, I think the American Standard Version translates that, if we are faithless, yet he, God, abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Once again, man, he might prove unfaithful to his to his professed allegiance to Jesus. He might prove unfaithful in living the Christian life. He might deny those things that he had earlier claimed and owned, but not God. God abideth faithful. Why? Because God's not like man. God means what he says. And so when God makes promises, yes, even those pertaining to judgment, against the wicked, friends, God means what he says. Now, back there in 2 Peter chapter 2, where we left off, is God giving us, through Peter, three examples from early in history that attest to the fact that God does mean what he says. And so, I ask that we give some attention to these three examples from the past. Again, emphasizing for us that God does mean what he says. And even though he may not have acted yet, even though much time may have transpired since he promised this judgment and its fulfillment, it is coming. We can be sure of that. Why? Because in the past, as evidenced and attested to by these examples, in the past, God had made promises of judgment and that judgment has come to pass. So, look at these examples with me and notice how they attest to the fact that even when it comes to judgment, God means what he says. The first one is found there in verse 4. And it has to do with the angels that sinned. Friends, they meant judgment. Look what he says there in verse 4. Four. Here's an explanation. He had just talked about this judgment that these false teachers and their dupe followers are hastening toward. He says it's not idle. It's not going to fall asleep in forgetfulness. It's real. It's certain. It's inevitable. How do we know that, Peter? Four. Here's the reasons. Here's the explanations. Here are the examples that testify to the certainty, the inevitableness of God's promised judgment. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to, the King James Version says hell. We're going to come back and visit that word here in a moment. And delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Friends, this is the first of those three historical examples that attest to the fact that when God promises something, even judgment, you can rest assured he means what he says. How do you know that, Peter? First of all, consider the angels. The angels. They paid the price of their sins. That word angel is uh, actually a a translation from a Greek term that really just simply means messenger. And so this word sometimes is used to identify a human messenger. But more often than not, in Scripture, it is used to designate celestial messengers. In other words, divine messengers, heavenly messengers, as we think of angels, celestial beings. It appears to me, and this is my my opinion, my conclusion, 
But it appears to me it is to those type of angels that Peter here references. A couple of reasons for that. Number one is chronologically. Notice these are the first, this is the first example that he's going to use. Even before Noah and the flood, before Sodom and Gomorrah. Now they are quite early in man's history. We're going all the way back to Genesis chapter 6, Genesis chapters 18 and 19. But before those examples, Peter cites maybe even an earlier one as it relates to the angels, the heavenly angels, celestial beings. Secondly is the language, the argument that he's using. The fact that they were cast down into hell, that they were held in bondage and in chains until the time of judgment. So, if that's your understanding, well, then we, uh, then we agree. And if not, you're welcome to have your own opinion, and I'm certainly not going to stand here and argue with you. But the point is the same. Here is an example from the past in which God had punished those who were deserving of it. In other words, God means what he says. Let's think about this example, assuming that it does speak to these heavenly messengers, angels, as we often uh, speak of them. Now, what do we know about angels from Scripture? Number one, we can be assured that they were created beings. We are also told that they served as ministers to accomplish the bidding of God. We learn that from passages like Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14. But here's something that we infer from passages like this and also Jude verse 6. And that is angels like men are accountable for their actions. Notice what it is, what is said of these angels. They sin. Let me ask you, what is sin? The Bible is very clear in defining for us what sin is, right? 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4, it's a transgression of God's law. And so here were angelic beings, here were celestial spiritual beings who were accountable to God and His law. Some of them transgressed that law, and in doing so, they were guilty of sin. That's what Peter says concerning their behavior and concerning God's uh, uh, appraisal of it. They were guilty of sin. Now, friends, the nature of that sin is something that we have very little insight into. Peter informs us that it happened, but there's a lot about it that we don't know. Look over in Jude, if you will. Keep your uh, ribbon there in Second Peter chapter 2. We're coming back. But look over in Jude. Jude, much like Second Peter. In fact, if you read Second Peter 2 and then Jude, you will find that they have a lot of things in common. Uh, but this inspired a very brief uh, letter of one chapter as uh, we divide it is, uh, is also about judgment. Judgment, once again, of those who would speak uh, falsely and, and uh, in some way uh, bring about, um, again, destructive heresies among the church. Notice verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Sounds much like the false teachers that Peter was describing, right? Well, he, like Peter, Jude also presents some historic examples that serve to remind us how God dealt with such individuals in the past. And among those examples, once more, the angels are used. Look at verse 6. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Friends, that's as much insight as God gives us with regards to the nature of their transgression. It is simply stated that they 
did not keep their first estate. That word is kind of like principality, their first office, their first position. Rather, they left their own habitation. Now, brethren, that's as good as I can give you. That's as much as I know. Now, there's a lot of speculation with regards to what form of rebellion that took. As you know, most believe that uh, the devil was a created angel, maybe of high status and position. But some believe, because of language that we find elsewhere in Scripture, even though it is not specifically stated, some come to the conclusion that he was guilty of pride and tried to rebel and usurp God's authority, and it was in that rebellion that other angels sinned as well. But we cannot know that for certain. Here's what we do know. Angels were guilty of sin. Their sin, as found here in Jude verse 6, is identified as they're not keeping their first position or office, but they left that habitation. And here's what we learn. How God dealt with them. Now, we don't know when it transpired. We don't know, again, more than that with regards to the nature of the sin. We don't know how many angels were involved. But we do know God's response to their rebellion. And what was that? That God put them in chains, reserved them until the final judgment. Notice the destiny of these angels that sinned. First, going back to 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse, uh, verse 4, God cast them down to hell. Friends, this is the only place in the New Testament where that word is found. Even though the English translation, hell, is found many times, well, this is the only time that this original Greek word is found and the translators chose to translate it hell. If you were to transliterate it, and what that means simply is take the Greek word word and then use English letters to look at it, it would read T-A-R-T-A-R-O-S or U-S, Tartarus, Tartarus. And so here we have identified where it is that God had cast these angels out of heaven into an unseen spiritual realm which served to keep them in Chains in bondage until such time as they would be summoned to a ultimate judgment to find and to hear their sentence. Which sentence we already know. Friends, that is Gehenna hell. That's the word that Jesus used to identify the place known as hell, Gehenna. A place of torment, a place of uh, unending fire, a place of complete darkness. And notice he even James, even, or excuse me, uh, Peter even speaks of them being in chains of darkness. I think Jude mentioned about being in the midst, midst of darkness. All of that coincides with this realm in which they were temporarily placed and held in reserve until the judgment day. Now, how are we to understand this place of the Hadean realm. Well, you remember the account of Lazarus and the rich man that Jesus told? You remember that back in Luke chapter 16? You want to briefly turn there with me? I just want to point out possibly where this corresponds to. You might remember uh, Jesus tells of two men, Lazarus, a beggar who was a righteous man, but he sat outside this rich man's palace and kind of leading up to his estate. You might remember the man passed by. The, the dogs licked on Lazarus' sores, but this man wouldn't give him anything by way of charity. And yet he fared sumptuously every day. And remember the great equalizer happened to both of them. Death. Death. So you'll recall what happened to Lazarus. Luke chapter 16 and notice what it says there, 
Verse 22, it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. All right? We, I say that as, as a scholar or a, a student of God's word, as students of God's word, we come to understand that is paradise. That's where Jesus went when he died. Before his resurrection, three days later, he went to paradise. You remember he had promised that to the, uh, to the penitent thief? Today, this day, you will be with me in paradise. Where did Jesus go? He didn't go to heaven. He went to the Hadean realm, but he went to the compartment of the righteous. Abraham's bosom, as identified here in this account told by Jesus. That's where this righteous beggar went. He died. Angels escorted him into Abraham's bosom, paradise. That was the compartment, if you will, the realm of the Hadean world where the righteous die, the righteous dead remain until the resurrection. Where'd the rich man go? Well, notice. At the end of verse 22, the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, again, a poor translation for us today, because the word is Hades. So he, like Lazarus, is in the Hadean realm, but he's in a different compartment. He, in hell, lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Notice, seeing Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. He's crying for mercy. He's crying for Lazarus to just tip his finger in water and bring it and cool his tongue. He's in torment. You remember what Abraham said to him? There's a great gulf that is fixed. You can't leave where you are. Lazarus, if he was so inclined, couldn't leave where he is. And so here we have a picture of the Hadean realm. One for the righteous dead, where Abraham and, this, uh, and Lazarus were. One for the unrighteous dead. That's where the rich man went. Notice a place of torment, a place of anguish, no doubt a place of darkness. I'm inclined to think that is Tartarus. That's the same place those angels, rebellious angels, were cast down into, awaiting the time of judgment. Because that's what the rich man is waiting. He's awaiting the resurrection. When he and Lazarus will come out, be, again, reunited with their now resurrected bodies and go before God in judgment to hear their final sentence. So, you don't have to agree with that again. But the best I can do for you is that these rebellious angels are in Tartarus, the place of the Hadean realm, reserved for the wicked, reserved for the ungodly, and they will there remain until judgment comes. Now, what is Peter's point? What is this all about? Go back to 2 Peter 2 as we make our application and our conclusion for this morning. Friends, Peter pointed this example as observed in his statement, for if God spared not the angels that sinned, how do we think of angels? You remember what the psalmist said? What is man that thou visitest him? You made him a little lower than the angels, right? And so we think of angels as occupying a privileged position even above man. Notice there in 2 Peter chapter 2. What does Peter say about angels there? Verse 11. Whereas angels which are greater in power and might. And so how the Bible identifies and characterizes angels is that they hold a privileged position above man. Now here's a distinction though. Angels apparently were not the recipients of God's redemptive work. And so for whatever reason, maybe because they saw God, but for whatever reason were in his presence, when they sinned, there was no hope for forgiveness. And so they were cast out. That was their reserved, uh, being reserved until punishment. Thankfully, as man, 
God has privileged us to be the recipients of his mercy. We can have forgiveness, whereas the angels could not. But here's his point. Peter is emphasizing, friends, if God in the past punished the angels that rebelled against him, that sinned against him, casting them down, awaiting a judgment, a judgment that would find them ultimately going to hell, why would anyone think that God won't do it when he's promised it to false teachers? Those who are deceived by false teachers and all the ungodly. Friends, if we could bring these angels back out of Tatars, and we cannot do that. But if they would come forth out of that unseen Hadean realm, you know what they were, you know what their message would be? God means what he says. See, they have come to realize that now as have the wicked who have passed from this life and gone to join them in Tartarus on the day of judgment. All of those would be willing to attest God means what he says. And so his first example, these angels, just as they sinned and received just judgment, so also will all the ungodly. Again, chapter 3 and verse 7, concerning that judgment that will coincide with Jesus' return and the destruction of the earth, notice at the end of verse 7, against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7, describes that as God's bringing vengeance on them that know not Him, that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. You remember the judgment scene as pictured by Jesus in Matthew chapter 24? He, or excuse me, chapter 25? He said those on the left hand will be told to depart into the everlasting punishment reserved for, remember, the devil and his angels. Friends, again, here is Peter's first illustration from history that should emphatically impress upon us. God means what he says. Maybe God will not visit these false teachers in this life. Maybe those who are committing sins of horrific fashion will get away with it in this life. But friends, we should find, they should find no comfort in the thought that God may overlook their sins or may somehow forget what they have done. Rather, as God reminded those in Psalm 50, you shouldn't think that I'm like you. You shouldn't think just because I've been silent that that doesn't mean judgment is not coming. God means what he says. And if you need a testimony from history of that, and if you could ask the angels, they would tell you, God means what he says. And so I encourage us, God's promises, they deserve our greatest attention. We rejoice and take wonderful delight in the promises that he has made to those who are faithful, those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ and in those provisions enjoy the forgiveness of sins and the promise of eternal life as the inheritance that God preserves for his faithful children. But friends, you should also know God means what he says when he promises that the wicked, the ungodly, those who have not obeyed the gospel, those who are indifferent to sin, those who have put it off and just think that they can continue on without God being um, one day, you know, visiting judgment upon them, they should remember, just as the angels have come to know, God means what he says. And so if there are situations, there are things in our lives that we need to address, 
Friends, don't put it off. As Peter promised those false teachers of his day, this judgment is not going to linger. God's not going to be silent forever. It will come. That day will come. And we don't know when it's going to be. And that's one of the reasons I believe God has withheld that information from us. He knows the only way that we will remain watchful, that we will remain ready, is because we don't know when it could happen. And friends, for us, it's going to happen whenever we pass from this life. Or if the Lord returns, and as Peter described it, it's going to come as a thief in the night. There's not going to be any additional warning. God has made us aware that it is coming, and we need to be prepared 